and I will share my screen as well. Okay, so here we go. You guys should all be seeing my screen now. And the first thing you can see, actually, if you have already clicked on that YouTube link, is our channel with all our uh, videos that from the recordings and the trainings that we have done so far. This was before we used Teams and we were always using WebEx or any other means of, um, of meeting with participants. So we have here an entire playlist of anything related to Umoja, TM, uh, whether it's finance, funds management, and so on. So you take your own time, go through the, uh, the channel and uh, view any of the videos you're interested in. But of course, you know, get started with the ones related to this training. And we will have have them all available, all the recordings available, so you can review them over the weekend and even during the week because the exam won't be until May 27th. Okay, so you have plenty of time to review the recordings. Okay, we went through the physical goods receipt this morning and we also explained the updates to be performed to the inbound delivery document. We stressed, we really stressed the integration elements between what is added to a shopping cart and how it impacts an ECC what is done to an inbound delivery document and how there's a downstream impact as well into the inventory and also TM. And now we're going to jump into the virtual goods receipt. Okay, so there's quite a number of transactions to do for the virtual goods receipt. Some of them are very similar to the physical goods receipt. One of the major differences is physical goods receipt has one single inbound delivery document that we update and we perform the packing, we add the actual a goods receipt date, we add the bill of lading as well, and then we receive it with the MIGO transaction we saw this morning. Okay, so we can close this presentation already and jump into our virtual goods receipt, okay, which is the point of today's session. And when we go through the virtual goods receipt, I'll share the uh, polling questions again to see how much we've, we've learned throughout the day. Major difference with the virtual goods receipt is that now we'll have two inbound deliveries, okay, because we have the vendors uh, also giving us the information related to the goods that we're purchasing and that are being transported. If, if let's say we're talking about an FCA inco term, we'll have one inbound delivery for from the vendor side up to handover location, and then we'll have a second inbound delivery, which is the one where the goods have already passed now to be uh, of ownership of the UN. We're responsible for them, and it's the second inbound delivery that we're going to be using to receive the goods finally into inventory with Migo again. So the new steps now from, uh, or the different steps from physical to virtual goods receipt are the ones that we're gonna be seeing between the inbound delivery one, how to post uh, virtually the receipt of the goods, the virtual storage location that we're going to be using, the transfer, the stock transfer order that we're going to be creating, because in a sense we have to tell the system once we become responsible for the goods being transported, we have to start tracking those in our system, even though they're not in our inventory yet, and then how we receive them in our inbound delivery. Also the roles involved. So still, if we look at the slide here, again, we'll, I've shared this presentation with you so you can access it. We're still in the red block for inbound goods. We're still talking about receiving goods, in this case, uh, virtually. The steps are here. You also have a number of slides with the roles involved. Inbound coordinator, once again, updating the inbound delivery document, receiving user, receiving the goods into inventory. But this time around, we have a number of more uh, users here. We have the virtual and direct receiving user, who is the one responsible for performing the virtual goods receipt transaction, okay, and posting that in ECC. We'll see that as that is a major difference. And of course, we have our inspection user, which was also uh, involved in the physical goods receipt if we're talking about a quality inspection of materials. All right, we also have a slide here that identifies, for those of you who are used to working with the INCO terms and receiving goods virtually and physically, you're well aware of this. So we talked about this morning, the physical goods receipt INCO terms, DAP, DDP. Okay, and now we're going to dive into the virtual goods receipt, XWorks, FCA, FOB, and DAT. So basically when ownership of goods passes from a vendor to the UN, when there's vendors transporting goods and there's freight forwarders transporting goods and basically handover locations. Okay, so let's start with going into the system again. Let's do this like we did this morning. I think it's very useful to see 
what we're doing in the system step by step. And the minute there is a question, um, Said, I think it's you uh, taking care of the chat. Jump in and interrupt me. No problem. OK, then, uh, Brian. But there is, there is nothing at the moment, so. Nothing yeah. at the moment. OK. Mm -hmm. So first thing I'm going to do is log in as the inbound coordinator once again. Your exercise, again, just like uh, we showed this morning, you have a virtual goods receipt exercise with a number of links to job aids, user guide, and then how to log into the training environment. Everything is explained here, what to select in every field, and starting with the VL06i, we're loading the, the uh, inbound delivery document. So that's the first thing we're going to be doing once we log into Mojo, which I think we should have already. Here we go. Let's expand this and select our training environment. We'll do the same here. Change our client to 520. Okay, very important for those of you who are going to be practicing exercises. This little field here, it seems insignificant, but is the difference between you logging in or not logging into the environment. If you see, when I first went in there and I double clicked, the first one that comes out by default is 510. Okay, so pay attention to that because in our exercises, we do mention at all times, for example, right here for this virtual goods receipt exercise, we tell you use the training environment, sorry, T1E and client 520. If you don't add the correct client, you won't be able to log in and you're going to wonder what's going on. Okay, so we'll change this to 520. We'll add our user. The best uh, option, in my opinion, is to simply copy copy and paste it. Same thing even with the password. Okay, there's less room for error. Just make sure you don't have any spaces in between. And if you do that, you should be able to log in without a problem. And here we are. Okay, and we'll start our virtual goods receipt the same way as this morning, VL06i. And we'll look for our inbound deliveries once again. But this time we're going to be looking for those with a different input term. This morning we were looking at our DAP. Inco term. Now we're going to be looking for those that are non DEP inco terms. So we can add our inbound deliveries here. Again, I'll open this multiple selection. I know for a fact that if I click on the space bar in any of the fields in ECC, I'll have all the historical documents uh, that have uh, entered before. I can always go back to my cover page, make sure that I'm selecting the proper inbound which is three four and three five okay so i'm going to make sure that those are the ones selected first three four and also three five and i'm going to add the other ones as well four five and four six which were the ones we did this morning okay so i'm adding a four inbound delivery documents here to the report i'm executing the report and i get my four inbound deliveries two daps two fcas Okay, same vendor, same delivery date, but you see the difference, the ones we did this morning, the actual receipt date was the 22nd. We have the bill of lading here for the physical goods receipt. So again, this is the one we did this morning. Now let's jump into one of them that is an FCA in quote term. Let's take this first one, actually, 32134. Brian, maybe before going... Uh -huh to the inbound delivery, a question from Hasim asking for mm -hmm. in um, DAP, would it be mm -hmm. two inbound deliveries or only one? But I think you mentioned it was two, no? Yes. Uh, no, okay, so good point, right? Uh, if Because I did mention it before, but if there's a question, that means it wasn't clear. So yeah. the, the inco terms, and let's go back here to our slide where I think it's actually much better uh, explained if you can see it. All right, let's go back here, right? So this is what we're looking at. You see the virtual goods receipt inco terms? All our XWorks, FCA, FOB, DAT. Virtual means two inbounds, okay? Because the ownership of goods is going from one hand to another versus the physical goods receipt uh, it, where it's DAP and DDP, we're only getting one inbound document because the vendor is the one in charge of delivering the goods all the way to the final destination. And by the time we become owners of the goods, the goods are already in the mission. Okay, so the virtual goods receipt, two inbounds, and these are the inco terms. The physical goods receipt, uh, we have two inco terms, only one inbound. 
Okay, so if we look back at this, we realize from the beginning already that this DAP will be just one inbound and the FCAs will be two inbounds. But right now I just have one. Right now I just have one single inbound, right? The first one that is generated. I have to actually manually create the second one and we'll see how that is done now during the virtual goods receipt. Okay, this is something that is not there by default. Only the first inbound is there by default. Once we start processing the first inbound delivery document and we post the virtual goods receipt, then we generate a second inbound. Okay, so I'm going to double click on this inbound delivery document there. And Saida, let me know if there's anything else to clarify on that topic. No, that was the only question for the moment. Okay. I'll go back to my presentation as well here, and I'm going to go back to this slide here, the one we have with our red block performing the virtual goods receipt. Look at this. Okay, so first we have one inbound, which is the one we're working with, the one I'm circling up top. Then we do the virtual goods receipt posting, and that generates a stock transfer order. So in a sense, what we're telling the system is that we're transferring goods from the point of handover, when the vendor is hand handing over the goods, to the freight forwarder, and we have to track that through the system with a stock transport order, which creates an outbound and eventually creates an inbound because then we have to receive it again. All right, so that's why we have the generation of two different inbounds. One, that is the document provided by the vendor, then we, the UN, start performing the transfer order, create the outbound, create the inbound, and receive into inventory with Migo. So it's a bit more complex than the physical verification process because there are more transactions to do. Let's go back and now let's see and let's start with our first inbound delivery. We have our information on the goods. Again, same exact goods that we had this morning with the other INCO term, DAP. We can also uh, open another session here and go to this T code that we are familiar with as well, ME23N. And we could use this code, okay, ME23N, to check the PO in ECC. Okay, so we have two. We'll have here, I'm going to make this a bit smaller. We'll have the inbound here in the background, and we'll have the PO here at front. But let me make sure I'm copying the right PO number. I'll exit my presentation, and I can use my, uh, I think the 3-4 will be my PO here, starting with 11. And we can always check that. Let's now add my PO number here and paste it. And when I execute it, we should have, again, our materials, which are the vaccine, paper, computer, and so on. But to make sure that I'm looking at the PO that is also linked to the inbound, we can check it through here by going to the confirmations. And let me just make this a bit bigger so we can have a good look at this. Okay, so we have a confirmation tab in the PO that will show us uh, the inbound delivery number here, 32134, which is, if I'm looking up top, 32134 is the inbound I'm looking at. So in the PO, we have a confirmations tab that show us the inbound delivery document, as well as in the inbound delivery document, remember we also had, going to the header tab, the in way of seeing if we had a PO linked to the uh, actual inbound delivery document, right? Remember that you have all the information linked together, uh, whether it's for the INCO term, the dates, uh, the warehouse, okay, and any other uh, link that is related, in this case, the PO number. So I recommend you guys take a look through these tabs, and you see here under the administration tab, we'll have the information related to the external ID. Okay, in the external ID, it's also in your PowerPoint presentation, is the linkage with the uh, PO number. Okay, so let's start with our inbound delivery number here. And what is the first thing we were doing is we were packing. We can go a bit faster on that since we already did that this morning. So the first thing would be to edit our document. Remember, we have our vaccines. Remember, we had to batch manage our vaccines first. So I'm doing that. It's a very easy process from here. We can select the same number, click on enter, and we have managed to make sure that our batch is done here for our vaccines. The next thing was to click on the packing, and that would take us to the screen here with all our materials, make sure we select them all, 
okay? And then we would simply pack. Remember that uh, the, this environment wasn't linking the packaging materials, so we had to manually do this. So we went to the field, we click on the matchbox, and we are now looking for the material type, okay? But we see that the tab that is showing here is material by old material number. That's not what I'm looking for. This could happen to you when you're doing the exercise too. We have a large number of options, okay? So we have by old material, by material description, material category, material group. So by material type is what we're looking for. Our material type is the type of packaging material that we're going to select. Remember that the one we are selecting is ZPAM, packaging material. We select OK, and we just click on the check mark. We have a number of packaging materials to select from to make it easier I selected just the bubble wrap which was this one of course didn't make much sense but I knew it was the one that worked that generated our packaging material information here but it's only when I click on enter that I have a handling unit okay remember handling unit is the integrating field with TM we double click on this field now we went to weight volume and dimensions and we made sure that the weight volume and dimensions were added properly. Okay, we did that this morning again. And we're just repeating these steps. And uh, just a reminder, we're only adding the information that is provided still by the vendor. Because at this point, we're only updating the uh, first inbound delivery document. Okay, the one that will reflect the vendor side of the uh, goods being transported. Yes, Saida? Or anyone, I think I heard something. If not, I'll just keep going. Yeah, no. All right. No, no, mm -hmm. not, yeah. Okay, very good. So right here, I managed to add my packing. I click on enter. It tells me the handling unit was changed, and I can save. Okay. Again, we can go back to our uh, actual inbound delivery document, which is this one here. Remember the FCA? We'll double click on it. And now if we were in the system in production, we'd have a TM status tab here that would show us that now our packing has been performed correctly and the integration with TM has worked properly. Okay, that would be our first step, packing. So what is our next step now that we have performed our packing and we're doing the virtual goods receipt? Well, again, if you guys follow the steps uh, carefully, either in the cover page, like I'm showing you here, you can just go step by step through here or you can simply follow the points that we're showing in the body of the exercise. So in the body of the exercise, we're telling you again to perform the packing first and then add the actual uh, GR date, okay? In this particular case as well. And now we're also adding information linked to the, um, either the uh, bill of lading in this case, okay? Which we did like we did before. Okay? We'll have the bill of lading information here. And we can even add the information related to the freight PO at this point, okay? And now I'm gonna dive into that uh, quickly. So I'm just gonna copy this information. I'll go back to my inbound delivery and let's make sure we edit. We add the actual GR date today, like we did before, 2020. Now, the next part was, remember we had a header option. We'll click on the header. We'll go to our shipment tab and we'll make sure that we have the proper bill of lading information. But not only that in this particular case, remember in physical goods receipt, we left it at this. Now it's a virtual goods receipt. So at this point, if, if we can think of it in, in a certain way, we have the vendor that has delivered the goods at a certain handover location. Now the goods are going to be taken care of by a freight forwarder. So we need to add that information here too. So the means of transportation field, if we select the match box here, would have to show the freight PO means of transportation, and we'd also have to add a uh, the the freight PO actually that uh, was raised now using the SOW. So what happened? Even though this is, seems like a very short and quick transaction, in between or before the steps before we actually perform this particular uh, step in the transaction, the virtual goods receipt. What happened here? So we had our shopping cart. We had our PO, we had our inbound, and the minute that the inbound was generated, even though we're doing the transactions all continuously now in the training, there's a long time frame in between. So in between this time, this has gone to TM, 
There's been a planning of transportation in TM. There's been a generation of an SOW document. This SOW document was taken by freight procurement. A shopping cart for freight was raised. Solicitation went out. We received the bidding. We chose the best bidder. And now we have a freight forwarder who's transporting our goods. And that's why we know what information we can particularly add here because we would already have a freight PO by then. But you see how much has gone through in between. Okay, we could have added the packing details a week ago or two weeks ago, and now a week after, two weeks after, we're adding the information on the freight PO. I can add anything right now because they're not linked together, ECC and TM. Eventually, you would be adding the correct freight PO number, but that would have to be added and that's one of the major differences between physical and virtual goods receipts adding the information on the freight forwarder and the freight po as well okay we can click enter and we can also make sure that we save this transaction again now we have added that information we can go back to our inbound delivery document and we can check and see that we have the actual gr date that we have our shipment information there as well and everything that we've just added still remains okay any questions quickly if not we move on and we continue with our next part here yeah no comments so far go ahead please okay so if you see in the exercise two, pay attention to when we tell you who to log in as so we did our first step as the and we can scroll up and see that the exercise also tells you this when you log in Login as inbound coordinator, okay? So when you see inbound coordinator here, your cover page, you just have to make sure that you're logging in as inbound coordinator. If we now tell you login as receiving user, you do that as well, and you make sure you're always selecting the correct login information. Luckily for you, the uh, usernames that we have here are all the same, see, except for one, and pay attention to that, I believe the warehouse senior user, but you don't even have to go that far. So basically, with just one username, you can do all the transactions that I'm about to do now in the system. So we tell you to log in as the, and I'm going to move in now, virtual goods recipient, so virtual receiving user. And we're telling you that the next step would now be, again, VL06i, pull your inbound delivery, and now change all the storage locations that you see in the inbound to a virtual storage location, which is 9,000. Okay. So Brian, maybe before uh, George just posted mm -hmm. a question there, uh, after you add the freight forward PO number, then could you please uh, repeat the next step after the freight forward PO number? Okay, uh, yes, we, we haven't done any of the steps yet. I was just explaining ah, okay. the exercise and the cover page and how to log in and out. I'm going to perform the step right now. Okay, so if we remain, let's say if we follow the exercise, we would basically run the VL06i report again. We would look for our inbound, double click on it, and now edit. And what are we doing? We're changing our storage locations. And what does that mean? So if I'm scrolling here to the right, remember that our materials, when we raise the shopping cart, we raised the shopping cart and told the system that we're receiving these materials into the storage location 3241 and that's still true but the problem is that we have already received them and we're uh, we're the owners of these goods already so we need to somehow account for them right or keep track of them so what we do since they're not here yet and we're not receiving them physically into our inventory we have to change our storage locations here from our locations added initially to the one for the virtual storage location, which is 9,000. And each one of these should be changed to the 9,000 storage location, which is a virtual storage location. It's like telling almost that we're kind of like receiving the goods in a sort of a cloud, because no one is really responsible for this. There's no fun center link to this storage location. It's just a way of uh, the UN to keep track of goods that are already in our possession even though the freight forwarder is the one transporting them. So that's the step that we have to do after we have added the information for the freight PO. Okay, we update the storage locations with the virtual storage locations. And this is done by the virtual receiving user, as you guys can see in the exercise. Okay, we always define who is doing what. And all you have to do is go back to your cover page 
and either log in as them or understand who is doing what exactly in the transaction. So once you have added the 9,000 storage location, there's also something else that is different. For those product IDs that have a flag for serialization, the system is also going to ask you to serialize your goods before you even go all the way down to Migo. Remember this morning, we were only serializing when we went down to the Migo transaction. At this point, we serialize before that. We do this during the virtual uh, posting. And that's one of the next steps that we're going to do now. Okay, so we're still in our inbound. We changed the virtual, uh, the storage locations to these uh, virtual storage locations. And we could actually try to, we could click enter and save. But we basically, what we want to do is get to the point of posting goods receipt. But before we do that, we have to make sure that we serialize our goods. So in the navigational menu up top, and Daniel was also spending some time in the previous days explaining the navigational menu here, you have options to add the serialization here, okay? So you see under extras, you have the serial numbers. And when you click on the serial number, it tells you, okay, select at least one item, all right? Which ones are we gonna be serializing? Vaccines are batch managed. Paper doesn't need serialization, but the computer does. Remember from this morning, Migo told you exactly what uh, transaction needed it. And here, I'm sure that if I clicked on the post of the goods receipt, I, I will also receive a notification of something missing. Okay, I could actually try that and see what the system is going to tell me. But you see, it says only zero serial numbers entered instead of 10 for the computer. So at least for the computer, it's telling me that I have to add something. Okay, so I can go back and say, okay, computer desktop, extras, serial number, and now we'll have our field here. Very similar to with Migo, we can say, you know what, create serial numbers automatically. And there they are. So for my, what is the quantity here? I think we have at least, uh, let me go, I can't go back, but I think we have at least 10 computers in this uh, shopping cart. So we have 10 serial numbers. And once that's done, we can go forward with that. And the computers have already been uh, received the automatic serialization. We can do the same thing for the x-ray, which also needs serialization. Serial numbers, and we do the serial numbers automatically. We only have one. We click on OK, and now we should be OK, OK? So we have serialized computer x-ray machine, still not even yet at the Migo transaction. We do this during the posting of the uh, virtual goods receipt. Let's go back to our exercise and understand that once we have done this, and once we have changed our storage location to 9,000, all we have to do is post. And once we post, the system is gonna generate a material document number. Remember when we did it for Migo? It's the same thing, but now we're doing this from the inbound delivery document, because this is a virtual goods receipt. We'll have a material document number, just like we had this morning for the physical goods receipt, but that material number is not for the inventory, uh, yet, we're still going to use that number now for the STO, for the stock transport order. Okay, so I'm going to post, and then I'll take the questions, if any. So at this point, if everything is done correctly, we should be able to post and have no issues. Okay, so we have our inbound delivery that has been saved. Okay, perfect. We can double-click on that. It doesn't seem to show us that nothing has happened at this point. We don't seem to have... Uh, any other uh, information, uh, there you go. Now, right away, the, the system has taken a bit longer, but here it is. We have uh, the document that was supposed to load right at the beginning for the material document, but I didn't get a material document number, okay? It, somehow the system just told me that it was done. I cannot post it anymore. It's already been posted, but I could jump to the uh, PO and maybe look at my material document number there. Are there any questions? What I'm going to do in the meantime is just go to my uh, screen here for administration and see if I can directly access my PO from here. If not, I'll go to the ME23N. But in the meantime, uh, anything? Yeah, just a question from Haluka, uh, who is asking if the good receipt sl uh, slip should be signed by the supplier. Okay, yes. Uh, this is something that a, those of our colleagues who have been to our trainings that work in the uh, in the peacekeeping missions tell us that 
having something in paper and signed is is essential. So yes, the supplier should sign the uh, the receipt, and that's the paper, the piece of paper, the final document that should be uploaded into the inbound delivery document. Okay, the one that is signed. But the process is only performed by the uh, inbound coordinator. Okay, the uploading of it and and the final addition of the date. But yes, the document should be signed. And what I just uh, the print slip that just popped up now, the little window that popped up before, will allow you, and in the exercise that we're sharing with you, we even explain to you how you could print that uh, slip as well, if you had to. So yes, definitely. Okay, uh, and I saw someone who raised a hand, but I don't see him or her anymore. Um, I don't... That's it. Um, okay. Somebody raise the hand but i don't see all right no problem so what okay. i was doing in the meantime and if somebody has a question uh, at any point say that just let me know what i was doing uh, really quickly is again i have my inbound here in my screen behind us which is the one that is three two one three four and uh, also my po displayed that is linked to that inbound the one ending in three one one okay so, and why did I show my PO number here? Because if we're looking for the PO that is linked to the inbound, so just to make sure that I'm looking at the PO linked to my inbound, I can go to any of the tabs here and select my confirmations tab and see that I have my inbound delivery, only one right now. Okay, this is important that we're still looking at our first one, the one ending in three, four. And I have a purchase or history tab that will show me the material document. So this is the material document that I was talking about before. Once I posted, the system generated a material document number, which is the one I'm going to be using now for my next step in the virtual goods receipt process. Okay, this is the material document that this morning we received when we did our Migo transaction. And now we're going to use for our next transaction. Okay, so I'm going to go back to our exercise, make sure that now I'm still low logged in correctly, we can see, we tell you here to go into ME23N and do exactly what I just did. Check for your material document number. What we have to do now is generate our STO, our stock transfer order. And this is done by the virtual receiving user. And we have a brand new T code we haven't seen so far, which is ZLE Auto PGI, which creates an STO. Okay, and we have to add the following details to this uh, transaction too. So let's dive into the system and see how this is done. Um, and maybe I can um, pose the question here. Uh, uh -huh. George is asking why why do we uh, also add uh, nine thousand storage location for DAP in Cotern items? Uh, I see that one of the step there was also adding the, the storage location. So he's asking why do we have to do that for the DAP in Coterm items? Uh, okay, actually we, we don't have any DAP in Coterm items in this transaction. I don't know where we have seen that. This is the inbound. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to make sure I execute that. I'm going to make this uh, window smaller. If you look at the PO that I'm looking at here, right, The this PO is only for FCA Incoterm. None of the items here are DAP. That's what we were looking at this morning. I believe under my delivery tab here, see, I have the FCA Miami USA Incoterm. So there's only FCA Incoterm in this uh, PO and inbound. It, the, the DAPs were this morning. What may have confused you is probably the fact that when I was launching the VL06i, I used several inbounds because I was showing you guys this morning's transaction. Okay, so what, what I did, if I just quickly reset and add the all the inbounds that we were looking at this morning and this afternoon, uh, right here quickly, we can see, I think, uh, three, five, and three, four. If I do this and I run this quickly and I run the report, you see, these are the two inbounds that I could have worked with this morning. I only worked with one of them, the one that has the bill of lading, versus the one I'm working with now, the FCA. Okay, so we've only done the virtual storage location for that one, for the second one, not for the first one. Okay, just a quick reminder of that one. 
Okay, where was I? So we have our PO here. I think we can, I'm going to leave this open, yes, because now I was doing the ZLE Auto PGI transaction. Okay, it's not in one of these windows. Just uh, excuse me one second and let me open. I think this is where it was. Okay, so this transaction, the one that I'm performing here, automatic stock transfer for virtual location. Okay, this is the next step. So after we have posted the virtual uh, goods receipt and we have a material document number, since now we have all our items going through this, let's say, cloud storage location, right? This virtual storage location, which is 9,000. What we want to do now is uh, create automatically a transfer order for these goods so that we're tracking them. This is the way that the system tracks the um, the goods being transported with an FCA inco term, right? They're being received virtually. TM also ha has a very big impact with this transaction because now not only do we have this in, a, in an STO that we've generated and that we basically all we can do is just check if the STO has been confirmed or not. With TM, we know every step of the way where our goods are and what has happened to them. But previous to that, we still do these transactions in ECC. So all I would have to add here is my material document number, which is the one that I had before, 260757. I add my source location here, 9000, the plant where it's going, date of entry, I believe I wrote today, and it's unprocessed. So if I do this and everything's correct, see in this case it tells me no data found. So what I can do is let me get rid of the either the material document or even get rid of the date here and see if I have any results at this point. Okay, so here you go. Here I'll have all unprocessed material documents. And here's where maybe I can take a look and now look for this material document number that I was looking for before to see if it's actually there. And I do see it. It's my last one. Okay, you could always use the posting date column to filter and sort by the uh, latest instead of the earliest. But I see that my document is here, 60757. We even have the other, my PO here to cross check. I have my PO number. And remember under the... Uh, PO information history. Uh, I, actually, I'm looking probably at the wrong one. Let's see if I make this bigger. Okay. We can see uh, the uh, the account history. Hold on. Let me, I think I have to refresh this one just so that we can all visualize this together. Okay. So I think this is the one and purchase order history. Okay. There you go. We have it. 260757, and that's the one we're looking at here, 260757. Okay, so that is the material document that I need to now generate a STO for. So I would select the line, and you see we have no STO number created. You see this column here for STO, the delivery number, which is going to generate an outbound. And if I keep scrolling to the right, we're going to eventually have to add the bill of lading to the STO delivery date and for APO number as well. Okay, so we can add that and we can even copy it from the inbound delivery that we had initially. If I'm not mistaken, let's go back and do that uh, quickly. And in the meantime, it's a good time for questions. Where's VL06I? And we're almost done with this transaction. Just a couple of more things and we'll be ready, but I hope it's all clear as to, it. for me, it's more important to understand why we're doing things instead of understanding the transaction itself. So I'm just going to run my two inbounds and I'm going to select the one that I was processing before. Okay, the one that I posted, you see how the posting is still grayed out. And what I want to do and the reason why I'm coming into this is that I'm making sure that I'm copying the same bill of lading and same freight PO number in my STO. Okay, so I can basically just copy and make sure that in my STO, I can copy my bill of lading number. I can add the delivery date, which is of course today. And I can add my freight PO number, which we can copy from here as well, which is simply one, two, three, four, all the way up to nine. And once this information is added here, make sure I select the line and we create the STO. 
and it should generate an STO number and a delivery outbound number here. If by any chance the screen disappears, okay, and now there's nothing to see. I don't know if the, the number is going to be there. Let me just close this window. See, every time you get one of these pop-up windows, as I was explaining before, this is what you would use now to print your document, okay? And this is the document you would eventually print and have either the vendor sign it or whoever would need to sign it. And that is responsible or that if you need the proof of a signature, this is what you would be okaying in, in order to have a, a print slip. Okay, so I'm gonna close that window. I'm gonna scroll down and see if I can see, this is my last transactions here with the green light. So here you go, we have now a STO number and we have now an outbound delivery number. So for you guys that are new to this and so that you understand what's going on, since we have goods that are in a sort of a limbo, right now the freight forwarder has picked up the goods from the vendor and is transporting them all the way to final destination, we need to keep track of this. And this is how we did it in ECC with the STO uh, through virtual goods receipt. We created an STO and we have an outbound. It's like our goods are coming out of a virtual uh, storage location and now they have to come in and be received into a physical location. So what is missing now is the physical goods receipt part. Okay, so it's like we had to do all the virtual goods receipt part before and now we're doing the physical goods receipt portion. And now we have an STO number and an outbound delivery number that either we can take note of or we can simply always go back to the PO and view the documents there in the PO um, document. Okay, so let's just make sure we exit the screen and I'll go back to my exercise quickly. Just make sure that we know that we did these a lot of PGI, we created our STO, we have our outbound delivery, and our next step is to go back into uh, now the uh, as the inbound coordinator take a look at the uh, second inbound delivery but we have to take a look at what that second inbound delivery is first okay and to do that we're going to have to check uh, as the exercise explains here okay so before i do that any questions on the sto and the, pro the steps that we have followed now uh, there was a question from hasim about the serial number assigned in virtual will will mm -hmm. we do another serial numbering process at the physical uh, receiving process Okay, very good question. So you won't have to, right? Since you already did the serialization at the virtual location, you don't have to do it again in MIGO. And we'll see that when we perform MIGO, that the system will not require us to do another serialization. And that's uh, actually very important. Okay, we're going to take a look at it and see what the system actually shows as a warning and what it shows as an error. But since we did it at the first step, we don't need to do it again. So right about now, we have our batching done already and we have both our serialized items. So it's like our work has been done way before the MIGO transaction. Okay, so very good question nonetheless. The exercise tells you, if you guys are reading here, to double click on the STO number and view the inbound. Okay, but we can always view these things later on because a lot of the times you'll be doing transactions and then wonder, oh, what was that number? How do I go back to this? How do I view my inbound? I just forgot what number it was. I didn't take note of it. Not a problem. You can always just go now back to the ME23N, which is a T code you'll be using a lot. And by simply using your PO number, okay, and executing that, you should be able to have access. You see this item detail uh, unfoldable here. Once I click on it and expand it, you should have access to all these documents, okay? We, either the material document or if we're looking at the confirmations tab, we should have access to a lot more of these documents that are being generated, whether it's the uh, STOs, material documents, and so on. Okay, let's take a look at our delivery and conditions, make sure that we have all the information uh, uh, here that we need. And if not, we can always go looking for our STO number. And I don't know why it doesn't show here yet. Maybe it's just taking a little bit. If not, we can always just look for our STO anyway. And it's actually a good way of um, showing you guys how to use the T-Core that we just used before. Okay, so let's say we want to go back to our ZLE Auto PGI. So we can select this T-Core again. 
we can execute it. And remember, you have the option to always view the processed, unprocessed, and the processed. So we could always just select processed, again, add your plant once again, and see now if your processed documents show. See, this is one of the cases that could always happen. If sometimes that happens to you, just make sure you get rid of uh, data entry dates, because a lot of the times the dates that you enter, uh, well, the system won't return, the training environment won't return the, the appropriate data. And then here you should have all the material documents that you have uh, processed. And the one ending in 757 is the one we're looking for. We can probably just scroll down and we can find it right away because there aren't many, okay? In real life, if you have many, you could always filter by date, by user, uh, any other way of doing so. We have our STO here, 199 and your outbound. So let's double click this time on the STO. And we'll go now, see, the FCA transport order, STO number. I didn't take note of it, so I didn't remember it. When I went to the PO, I didn't see the information linked to my STO, my outbound, and so on. But going back to ZLE Auto PGI and re, uh, running the report once again with uh, the processed items instead of the unprocessed, I'm still able to always recuperate all the data. So remember that we show you a lot of reports and we show you one purpose for the reports, but a lot of the times these reports have multiple purposes. Always take a look at the prompts and realize if you're searching for something that's processed, unprocessed, partially processed, okay, the reports will always offer you a lot of options. We have our material document and we have our outbound delivery number here. The exercise is telling us here what to do now with the outbound. And it's basically telling you double click on the STO and click on the confirmation tab, double click on the inbound delivery. Okay, this is the second inbound delivery number the system generates for the physical receipt. Okay, remember we have two uh, uh, inbound delivery numbers. We're in our STO now, and under our confirmations tab for this STO, we have a different inbound delivery number, the one ending in 217. Remember the inbound delivery number we were looking at earlier was the one that was ending in 134. So this is our second inbound, and this is the one that we have to use now to do the physical goods receipt in Migo. If you use your first inbound, you'll see how the Migo transaction is going to return an error or give you a warning. All right, and that is our last step in terms of virtually receiving the goods. If you see in the exercise, you basically can update the inbound delivery to with also the information of the freight forwarder, okay? Also the PO number, we can repeat those steps to make sure that they uh, are also in the document when we're receiving the goods through Migo. I'll do that in a second. And then our next step here is to monitor. If you want to, we can monitor the STO. Remember what I was saying before that, before TM, this was the way to monitor goods that weren't yet received into our location but we were actually owning them already. So in the process of tracking these, we can monitor stock transfer orders using MB5T. We can skip that step completely and we can go directly into our Migo transaction. Okay, so my last step here for my inbound, if I double click on this second inbound, remember we can edit and I'm updating my second inbound with the information of the bill of lading or freight PO. In this case, it's done because I added it to the STO number. So it's there. It's fine. I can save. And now I can move on, go to Migo and receive physically. So you see the amount of steps we had to do before for the virtual goods receipt. And now the only thing we'd have left to do is again, go back to our Migo transaction and run this transaction with our second inbound delivery. If I do my first and before I take the questions, I just want to do this once again, goods receipt, inbound delivery. And what I'm going to do is type in my first inbound delivery. Okay, not my second one, my first one, and execute that. The system tells me there are no items selectable. And this may happen to you when you're running this uh, transaction. If you're new to this, of course, this may happen to you. And that's because you're using the uh, first inbound and not the second one. Three, two, two, one, seven should be your second one. And when you run that one, now we have our items. Okay. So Saida or anyone else, whoever was trying to speak up. Yeah. Um, I think we have two, two people who have 
raise the hand, but before that, there's a question from Hasim. If there's um, a good rejected and the supplier de delivered the replacement, then a new serial numbering will be done for the replacement. Or can we use the same serial number created for the rejected good? And no, you should you should uh, create a new serial number for the new item because it's probably going to have, uh, even though we're using, we, we have to link it to the proper product ID. Okay, so the rejected one should be rejected and we should generate a new one for the new line. If we haven't done it in, in the uh, posting before the virtual goods receipt posting. If we're talking about doing it in, during the Migo transaction. Okay, good. Um, and then I see George who has raised his hand. George? Yes, hello. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, just a quick question. Um, at the stage where we generated the STO number and mm -hmm. at the same time the outbound uh, number, yes. uh, I just lost the, 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 the step where the second inbound was generated. So from how from that stage of STO and outbound, we got the second inbound. If you could repeat that uh, step. I, I'm sure it's a, just a, sm a small step there, but I lost it at some point. Okay, very good. Definitely, George. Uh, I you. will repeat that. So just quickly, once we ran the ZLE Auto PGI transaction, right? Once we did this and we added the information basically on the plant, we took out the date, right? And we just processed this. This is for the unprocessed, okay? We saw that uh, we had a number of um, uh, we had a number of transactions there pending. The minute we created the STO, uh, automatically that STO was generated, the outbound was generated, and the inbound was generated automatically. So all of those were generated together at the same time. Okay. Ah, so, okay. Okay. All right. That's that's the uh, main idea here. Um, actually, now it's asking me to write this. Let me see if I can write that 05 2020. Uh, so that's the, that's why we missed it because it, it happened simultaneously. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. And then I see Raymond as well, who has raised his hand. Raymond. Hi. Uh, my question is: uh, at times when a virtual goods receipt has been done. Uh, the equipment is already uh, automatically in the STO. Let's say the system, the user system shows STO. And then when the equipment has to be assigned, then we have to take it from that uh, user uh, system status out and then assign an equipment. Or does it have to happen this earlier or is that the, the normal circumstances? Okay, I, I think uh, I think I understand what you're saying and and if i'm correctly understanding no that is a mistake right they, they should have changed the status earlier so of course the process that we're doing now and when we receive these goods into the system uh, immediately after we receive the goods into the system there should be an update in the equipment okay the system automatically updates the equipment status with the system status but then there should be a manual uh, status uh, transaction done uh, to correct that. So if, if it's still showing something like pending or in in, uh, in transit or I, I can't remember right now the status of that equipment, that should have been fixed before that. You shouldn't be assigning something that is not considered to be, for example, in the inventory and available. Exactly. So yeah. that has to happen by the inbound coordinator or? No, no. This The status of the, once we have received the, uh, the equipment mm -hmm. into the the system that would have to be done by the uh, material, um, uh, the data maintainer. The SD10. Data SD10. 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 Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't Obviously. remember the, the the name, and it wasn't coming up exactly. Not not the inbound coordinator. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks, uh, Daniel, for jumping in. So exactly, and that is a very common error with the, the workshop that we had a couple of weeks ago on liquidation. It was all about these types of mistakes. Okay, so if that's the last yes, question. There was no other questions there. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Well, mm -hmm. that's pretty much it. At this point, we would have to, the Migo transaction we have is just the same as the one we had this morning. The only difference is that now we should have all the batching 
uh, either done. I don't see the batching information here for the vaccine hepatitis because maybe for the second inbound, it didn't show. So very good. And maybe that's the same thing that's going to happen with these um, other documents here. No, see, serial number is there. The same thing for the x-ray. Very good. So the only thing that hasn't uh, gone through is the batching. And so that's the one thing we'd have to uh, make sure that we add to this inbound delivery document here. But you see the serial numbers for the computer have gone through and they're there. So we wouldn't generate them again. OK, that's not what we're supposed to do. So we could just make sure we quickly add the batching information here. And basically, uh, we would be done with our transaction once we uh, receive the goods physically. OK, we'll also have a material document generated. So I'm going to go with the same number. I'm going to adopt this for the full 100. We know that the batching is done there. I can check. We can see if there's any major errors. We only have warning messages here. OK. And we can maybe double check if we want to line by line to see if there's anything that we would be missing and we want to actually add. But everything is a warning message. So at this point, I would be OK to just post generate a new material document number and now we have finally received these goods physically into inventory as well okay so that's our last step for the virtual goods receipt there's more to go into warehouse and so on but we have seen enough and we have learned about all the integrating elements i'm glad that we have been able to process it all the way through and the questions have been very good from my side I would be done with the afternoon session and a uh, good thing because it leaves me right the time for a quick break and, and Daniel jumping in with reporting, if that's okay with you, Daniel. If there's no other question, Saida, uh, maybe we can take a break now. And the first thing we can do while Daniel prepares and you guys come back from break is take those polling questions again really quickly. And uh, that's it. The session would go on to uh, you, Daniel. So if there's anything else, Saida, any other questions? No, no there's nothing um, on the chat. All right, so I'm going to close these windows here. And I think that I'm going to share the link to the polling now. For those of you who never take breaks and, and remain there anyway, I'm going to share this, OK, already. This is the same exact questions we shared this morning. Now, after we've learned, and let's see what we've learned, if we've actually uh, learned anything in this morning and afternoon session, hopefully, I'll go to my Teams channel here and share it in the chat with you guys. But I would also recommend to take a break if you can now. And if you're not going to take it, uh, just make sure you uh, complete these polling questions. So we'll be back in another five minutes.
Brian, I don't know if you um, if you're there. Brian? Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to um, yeah to, uh, to mention the question from Javier. I know that we are still in break, but um, maybe we can address that um, at any moment when you when you want, and then we come back. I am I am on it. Uh, ah, okay, cool. Okay. Thank you, Danny. All right, let take me take a. Break, a... Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna read it though. In in the meantime. Okay, Javiera, so thank you for the question and, and thanks, uh, Daniel, for the answer too. So exactly right, the, the, the uh, serialization is uh, provided uh, during the, the posting, that's when it's generated, right? So the inbound delivery document would not really uh, show us that, uh, that serialization. So we see here, once the GRS performed, you can always check the inbound delivery. Uh, exactly, uh, be a way to get through this through the navigational menu on the top. So exactly, so if we go back here, and I think this is the one that we were looking at. Uh, you see, uh, for example, this would be nice here. We have the batch vendor information uh, from from uh, the earlier uh, transaction. And then uh, what Daniel, I think, is, is talking about here is the um, navigational menu here at the top. But let's select, of course, first. Let's go with one. So we just see the one here. OK, there you go. I believe this is what Daniel is referring yeah. to, correct? Yeah. Okay. I didn't recall exactly whether it was extras or environment, but yes. But obviously, the goods received has to be performed. Exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. even virtually or physically, whatever. Exactly. The, the moment we posted this, this virtual goods receipt, we had already selected those numbers. So once we had done that, you could always go back to this inbound and see it. And they would have been there already. So one of the things that uh, maybe it's the training environment, but one of the things that uh, surprised me a bit was the uh, the vaccines, right? We had a batch to manage them in the inbound, first inbound, but then the second inbound in Migo, it didn't show. I wonder why the, the serialization does jump to the second inbound, but doesn't do so for the batching of the vaccines. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's either a reason, either technically or, or business yeah. reason behind it. Remember that uh, at some point, uh -huh. Into all these uh, material ladies, they have to do. They have to be quality inspected, or uh -huh. maybe once they are quality inspected, maybe the patch will appear. I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there is a there is another step in between, right? The inspection of these goods. Even though it's true that we process all these transactions quickly in one step after the other, there's a long time in between uh, one step and the next. So the the reason why the batching does not go through as, as it does for serialization is because of course these vaccines first have to be inspected and maybe even rejected or blocked or any other transaction that has to go in between that's why the system i think doesn't automatically do it so that it gives you another heads up right before they're received into the inventory okay uh, so that's it from here i don't want to take up um, 
all your time, uh, Daniel, either. And I know we still wanted to show the maybe the quickly the polling question. So only 21 responses. OK, can we can take a look and see if things have gotten better from this morning? Uh, yes. OK, now we understand from the first question. What is the linking element? ECC and TM is our handling unit. Very good. Remember. ECC and TM, okay, linking element during packing. I wanted to be as specific as possible, is the handling unit, okay? That's what's the linking element. Number two, at what point during the physical receipt process is a piece of equipment serialized? And we said when it's received into inventory through MIGO, very good, okay? And the majority of the question, the answers go there. That's the, very good. And now, which of the below INCO terms would not trigger a virtual goods receipt? So we have almost 100% for DAP, but then we have one for XWorks. Okay, so clearly it's DAP. The other three would automatically generate the virtual goods receipt. Same thing for number four, which document is used to receive goods physically from a virtual goods receipt? And we have, okay, receive goods physically from a virtual goods receipt. So as we saw, inbound delivery document two. Remember, the second inbound delivery document generated from the stock transport order is the one that we use to receive goods physically. That's the one that we use during the MIGO transaction. We use the second inbound. Okay? So this one, I still see seven in the STO, but it's the second inbound that is the key answer there. And number five, we go to which of the below occurs automatically during goods receipt. Okay, and this one, I think maybe just based on the answers, we can figure out what was the uh, the correct one. It is true that it doesn't occur automatically, meaning that if we don't check the box, it won't happen. But it's true that if once you check the box, it does serialize automatically. So it's the serialization of materials. Quality doesn't happen automatically. Materials aren't received to block stock automatically. And the batch management isn't done automatically either, right? You have to go, select it, search for it, select the right one. Serialization is the only thing that you simply check the checkbox and the system automatically generates them. Actually, the, the checkbox is called generate serial numbers automatically, okay? So I think it's better results from this morning. There's also less responses. I don't know if people are still answering, but um, I don't want to spend too much more time on that. If there's nothing else, over to you, Daniel. OK, thank you, Brian. Um, all right, so it's still 45 minutes to go. Um, and the idea is to go through one of the BI reports for POs and uh, just do a bit of a review of the T codes that I shared with you yesterday. Although uh, between Brian's uh, session, my, my session yesterday, we covered at least two or three of them. But um, I mean, I think it's worth it to at least go through the rest and show to you the, the dynamics, especially for the ones of you who are not really acquainted with the reporting in, in ECC, right? And the different uh, options that are there at hand um, in order to analyze data. So without, without further ado, I will go directly into the, into the system, okay, in BI. Uh, remember that um, our folder, the famous source to, source to acquire folder is uh, just below the shared analysis folder in production. Um, some of you have been in contact with some of you throughout the week. Uh, you were a bit preoccupied about, you know, accessing these T codes, uh, the user access provisioning part. Uh, do not worry if you only see seven elements. If you do see those seven elements, that means that you have only, let's say, a basic view, basic role for source to acquire, meaning that you will, you will have access to these web intelligence reports. So if I sort by type, the first one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, because here in historical reporting, we have a web intelligence report, uh, I believed. Well, I thought, well, so if you only have six access to six reports, that means that you are a basic user, but you need to have access to the full scope to analysis workspaces. That's why we're asking you, we are suggesting you to um, to get the BA23, okay? But uh, eventually you will get it, don't worry. I mean, uh, it's uh, there is no 
uh, reason why you shouldn't get this type of access if you are uh, managing the POs, if you are managing uh, requisitions, if you are going to, within the um, process of uh, source to acquire. So, I mean, eventually you will get it, so don't worry. So the idea today is to go through two reports. Uh, the first one is the PO order monitoring. Here, receives monitoring, which is closely linked to what we have been discussing the past two days, goods received, virtual goods received, inbound delivery, service and receipt. The second one is the um, PO, purchase order analysis area. Uh, this is the one that uh, I like the most out of the, these uh, 13 reports, but unfortunately it's not working well. Uh, I was in, in a call in a meeting with, um, with our VA developers in, in Valencia this morning, and they told me that uh, the whole data universe, the scheme of this report, it's been um, maintained during today. It was yesterday and today, so uh, a new release will be posted probably around uh, 8 p.m. in New York time. So uh, it has a couple of improvements, so even the performance will be improved and some other items will be will be over there. So. Um, Unfortunately, I will not be able to go through this uh, through this one today. But uh, in any case, it works in the same way as we showed the requisitions. Eventually, you have a list of uh, attributes related to um, the different elements to the PO, all the fields that we have been discussing all these uh, uh, days related to the account assignment, related to the plans, related to the inbound delivery, goods received, all those all those items will be present in the report. And then you'll have the PO numbers that you can drag and drop and you can use elements in order to do analysis. But uh, this one, the PO receives monitoring is more, more focused on the goods receipt process, right? So let me open that one. If I double click, I will see this uh, prompt, okay? It's a uh, I'm going to show all the elements in the prompt in the left panel. Basically, um, the whole thing pivots through the plant, right? Eventually, a plant is a, a master data element related only for inventory management purposes. So it's it pivots through a plant, but then a range of creation date of POs. So the system has all the POs created in all the years for all the plants. And it will be a matter of selecting a plant or selecting a creation date from and to, and then you will shrink a little bit the number of POs based on your on your entity or the date range that you want to analyze. Okay. Then you have here an important field: only POs with reception, yes or no. This one, right? If I go into the match code, basically you are asked, telling the system, yes, I would, I want to have visibility of the POs which items have not been received yet, so there is no good receipt whatsoever. Uh, or on the contrary, um, I just want to select the POs with some sort of a good receipt or service, service and receipt created, right? So I will limit only my analysis by the POs received, okay? But uh, usually what we, I mean, the, the good practice is to start with the, with the full scope. So you will, re, you will actually see all the POs regardless whether they have been received or not. So we put no. Then what I put here is the plant AT00, which is, is a UNOV in Vienna. Okay. And uh, the pre PO creation date will be January 2020. PO creation date 2 will be May 2020. So uh, I will expect to see POs or information on POs for the last five months, regardless whether they have been um, delivered or not. And uh, uh, besides that, you can even uh, analyze the data by contract. So you can set up a contract number. If you know that 47 type of contract, you will put it there or you can look it look it up in the in the match code in case that you do want to focus your analysis on particular contracts or a number of contracts. But in our case, what we will do it's uh, it's uh, leave it blank, and uh, as well you what you can do it's you can set a range of dates for the reception of those goods or or the um, uh, when the services are being rendered in case that we are talking about uh, services, right? So it's a it's a pretty let's see uh, enriched uh, 
prompt that if you understand more or less the items within the whole PO and inbound delivery and goods receive process, you will be able to um, put information that you need in order to do the analysis. So remember always to check that box, save these prompt values with the workspace so we can eventually when you save this report, you will be able to retrieve the same data as you put it initially. Okay, so the idea was to click in OK. And I have here the report, right? So I'm, I'm avoiding all this um, time wasting. So I'm basically in the different phases of the report and putting different uh, tabs over here. So this is the report that you will get. OK, there is a summary tab and then a detail tab. OK, let's focus first on the summary tab. In the summary tab, what I did, it's um, I dragged and dropped in these rows the first part of this uh, of this report, the material type description, the physical receipt movement type description. This is the second tab and then the PO type. OK, so um, as long as, as I do see this hashtag um, here, that means that uh, the physical receipt has not been done right for all these POs. So no physical receipts for all this. That's what you see in this rows, all zeros, because there is no, let's say, uh, movement type that it, that's the one that we select in MIGO as Brian did uh, before. There is no movement type involved. So therefore, no MIGO, no posting, no NFI, no goods received, no service entry sheet whatsoever. So the system uh, puts it in with this uh, with this sign, right? On the contrary, if in the uh, prompt we had selected instead of no, yes, in the report itself, I wouldn't see any of these hashtags whatsoever because I would I would focus my report on the goods received or service entry sheets as well. So I hope it's clear, right? But um, so it's a it's a way to understand the whole process of the res receiving an inspection of the goods receipts, excuse me, the goods and then the service entry sheets as well. So as you can see, we have the material type, whether it's a finished product, whether there are medical supplies, packing materials, raw materials, spare parts and supplies and equipment. As you can see, um, let me put a, a total, right? So I will. Um, in material type description, I will right click and miss, and then I will include totals, show totals. So I will see the total number of POs involved and total number of physical receipts. So it's uh, uh, around 498, okay, of total POs involved in uh, Vienna for the past five months. And the breakdown by material type is this one. Right. This is just a way to do an analysis, right? Um, then the PO type uh, will define whether the PO is related to HR, whether it's for goods and services, whether it's low value acquisition, you see, low value acquisition. In case that, for example, um, we want to focus our analysis for, um, for the low value acquisitions, it will be a matter of just in PO type here, we will double click and then out of all these PO types, you will select only set VLP. So you would unselect everything. So everything is blank here. And then we only will select set VLP, which will be the low value acquisitions. Okay, and then the refreshed in the background will give you only the PO types set VLP, as you can see, right? Um, so, because now the set VLP is already there, what you can do is you can put this attribute in the background because you know already that the PO type is low value acquisition. Yeah. So, uh, at the end of the day, as I always tell you, it's a matter of just you practicing, you uh, facing all these uh, the elements of navigation, I bet for sure. Um, the plant or the type of POs that you will analyze will be familiar to you because these are uh, documents that are uh, belonging to your own EU and entity. So you will understand much better than myself, for example, um, how uh, to read or understand this data, right? 
Um, once you are comfortable with uh, the analysis that you have here in material type or description, you can always go to the left panel and start analyzing by, for example, contract. You have uh, a lot of attributes related to the contract use, okay? With the document number, which is the vendor, the vendor name, uh, the target value of header level, so plenty of information on the, he on the header. Uh, excuse me, on the contract, then information on the buyer as well, the buyer ID, buyer name, the email. And uh, um, as uh, I told you before, everything pivots through the physical material here, so physical receipt. So everything related to the goods receipt or service entry sheet will be um, of um, really you no know, importance for this report. Why? Because uh, you have here lots of inform information that you can find here in MIGO, in the fields in MIGO transaction. The document year, the document item, the PO number, the PO item, the physical receipts entry date, whether it's a credit or a debit indicator, the fund center, movement type over here as well. So you can see there are a lot of fields related to the physical goods receipt. The plant description as well. PO approval, PO approval date, PO delivery date, whether that PO is for consumption or not, the PO status, PO number as well. So you can, I mean, this is one of the most important fields, the PO number, because eventually we will drag and drop the PO number here in the rows, right? In order to break down all these uh, categories of elements within PO numbers, right? Obviously, if I do here, and let me just uh, drag and drop uh, first, uh, let me just remove this. Uh, but, uh, Danny, maybe, sorry, before you remove the hashtag, uh, Haluka is asking what is the meaning of this hashtag? Is this because the, uh, the GR has not been posted? You know, the... Exactly, yes. Okay. Um, because it's not been posted, so the system is not giving you a material type. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once, once, thank you, Saida. Once the POs or um, the service entry sheets, if it's a uh, PO related to service has been certified, then we will have uh, our uh, data over there and uh, we won't have any type of hashtag. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's another, a bit of an idea. Sorry. Um, another one from Raymond uh, is asking, the total of POs differs from the total of physical receipts. Uh, is it because of the line items? Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember that uh, we do each each PO. Thank you, Saida, for I think it's good that we uh, I'll clarify all these things. Eventually, we are going to receive the goods by line item because in one PO we may have 150 lines and we may receive, for example, 20 computers, but the rest of the IT equipment are still pending to be received. So we will perform MIGO to a particular line, but the rest will be pending still to be delivered. So that's why you have uh, more physical receipts than POs. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions before I uh, resume? Uh, no, that was the last one. Thank you, Dani. Thank you, uh, Saida. So um, let's remove the, 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 let's see, POs which have not been received yet. So uh, by, in order to do that, it's, you see, material type description here. It's um, the hashtag over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click material type, and I will see the different categories within this description. So what I will do is I will remove the one I don't want to use now, and I click in OK. Yeah, I'm glad that uh, in the afternoon it's working a little bit faster than in the morning. Usually it's the other way around. But, uh, this morning I really had a hard time in order to create this report. Um, okay, so once this is done, I will do the same thing with the physical goods receipt movement. Okay, double click. And just uh, when I want to underline the fact that every time that I'm filtering any type of category of element, you see this yellow funnel here? That means that this attribute has been filtered. So when I click in OK, the second attribute here from physical received movement type description will turn from these, let's say, bluish type of uh, stripes to a yellow funnel. So it's a way 
for you to understand that the that the attribute had been in a way um, filtered. So uh, as we always say, if you have one attribute with the same category of element for all the different lines, just put them movement type here, the description, put it in the background because it, it doesn't give you another value to have here. I don't know, like a, uh, 14, uh, excuse me, uh, seven rows here saying the same thing. You know that the physical receipt is done. We know that uh, it's filtered only by set VLP for uh, POs uh, for low value acquisitions. So the number, to the total number of POs is 47 with this physical goods receipt. And the breakdown, which is driving your analysis in this tape, it's the material type description. Okay? So uh, now we can drag to the PO number into the rows, and then this material type description, finished product, medical supplies, raw materials, will be breaking down by these POs, you see? All of them starting with 23. Why? Because they are LVAs. We go all the way back down, all right? If you see a 22 PO here, something is wrong. Uh, something is wrong with the report, or something is wrong in ECC in the creation of the, this document, all right? So uh, this is the breakdown by material type and description. Remember that in the prompt initially, we selected our plant in Vienna, okay? In Vienna over here, but you can always change the plant and do the same analysis for another UN entity or even a contract number, right? Instead of a full scope of POs, all right? So. Then uh, let's see that once you see the list of POs, uh, you just want to focus on your analysis on supplies and equipment, okay, this one. So it will be a matter of selecting this uh, category of element, right clicking and keep those members. So you're asking the system to keep only supplies and equipment and get rid of the rest. But you're not getting rid of them. Basically what you're doing is you're, you're filtering by supplies and equipment, only that. Okay, that's why this material description still is with this yellow funnel. Okay, and then you have here at 35, that's why you see 35 rows, LVAs with uh, 94 items received so far. We can, I don't know, focus our analysis in this one, in this uh, LVA with 14 goods received and see which one it is. Again, I selecting, I'm clicking on this 23 and then keeping this member. But I could go, I, I could do the same thing by double clicking on PO and selecting this PO. What I think is easier and more visual is if you just right click on this number and then you come up only with this information. Okay. Now I think that we can, for the PO number, we can, um, let's say, uh, uh, remove this total. So let me right click in the PO number totals. I know, not the PO number, the material. It's, if, it is, if it is not one, it's the other totals. Height totals. So I will see only one PO number for supplies and equipment with this PO. Uh, basically, what we're doing here, we're drilling down, right? We uh, started with the full scope of five months POs in uh, Vienna. Then we uh, shrink a little bit of our, our analysis only for low value acquisitions. Then we shrink even more to the material type description, supplies and equipment. And eventually a PO number brought our attention, which is this one with 14 physical goods received. And then we're focusing our attention to this particular one PO number. So uh, in BI, uh, this is another approach. You can have a full analysis of the whole data without drilling down or on the contrary, you may see things that kind of like brings your attention or um, you know, uh, gives you an idea of analysis and then you focus your analysis on that particular item, in this case, this PO number. Then, um, yeah. yes, Sorry, Saya? Danny, um, Georges is asking if you could please repeat how to do the background layout filtering. Background layout filter. Well, thank you, Saida. What I did is uh, basically the rows that I had present initially. Here I had my PO type set VLP and my physical uh, physical received movement type, the physical reception, I had it present of my rows here in this particular box. What I did is I put them in the background, 
because I know that I'm focusing my analysis on on set VLPs on low value acquisitions. Because if I'm putting here, if I'm putting back my PO type here in the rows, my analysis will be enriched totally with one cell here that actually doesn't give me a lot of uh, value. And on the contrary, it's kind of like a uh, limiting a little bit the space, right? So this PO type, which still is important because I filtered only by low value acquisitions, instead of he being here present in my report, present in my analysis, I'm dragging all the way down to the background. So still the PO type LVA is present, but it's not visible in the analysis, right? So I have more space here to play around with the data. So, but you can filter in the background or you can filter here in the rows as well. Um, hope it's clear. Um, so this is the PO number. If you want to know exactly which it's uh, this PO about, uh, let's uh, use the description, for example, of material description. If it is there, Let's see physical inbound delivery. You you even have the inbound delivery item in case that you want material type description. This is already now material group here. Material group description. So I'm dragging all the way to the rows. So I will have my PO number here broken down by the different materials involved. In this case, look. It's all arms and ammunition, in this case, this PO number. Um, let's see, material group, material description, contract validity. I can see the contract number used for this LVA. Okay. So here I don't have a contract number. Let's see if I can right click. It's an LVA, so well, it makes sense that there is no uh, contract in place, but in the case, I can. you can always go and display here. If you right click in any particular attribute, display, sometimes you have more options than key. You have key and text, so you can actually change the, um, the value here that you can, that you can see from a code to a text as well. So contract number is not uh, interesting. So as you can see, it's a matter of going to the left panel and you know dragging and drop different fields in order to enrich and see your, your analysis, right? So remember what I, we did is we went from a prompt with uh, the plant Vienna with these five months, all the goods received, uh, whether, uh, excuse me, all the POs, whether they have been received or not, in our, um, let's say, uh, analysis. And then from there, we filtered by um, um, LVAs. We filtered by physical goods received done, right? We took out all the POs, all the LVAs, which uh, haven't been received. And then we even filter by this PO number with these 14 physical goods received. We can see whether we have inbound deliveries in place as well. Physical inbound delivery number. Here we go. Physical inbound delivery number. Let's see, we have some information. And here we have one physical inbound delivery. And that means that uh, probably these 14 items, they have the same delivery date and probably the same in term, right? What we discussed before with Georgios and, and uh, Brian before, okay? If we did have different material, uh, the same material groups, but with different mm, delivery dates and even the Inco terms, then we will may encounter a little bit more of a uh, of number of uh, inbound deliveries over here. Um, so this is the PO receipts monitoring, just focusing basically our analysis on, and I will repeat again, the contract, so the contract has a large number of items. The material that we are going to receive eventually or service, right? Information of the goods received, dates, uh, type of material, items, whether it is accredited or levy, the entry date, plenty of attributes there, you see. P 
PO information, delivery completed, delivery date, whether that PO is for consumption, the inco term, the number of items, information on who was the requisitioner, okay? And if it is a service, service entry sheet creation, service document date, service external entry sheet number, and shopping cart information as well. But as uh, Brian explained before, uh, sometimes we do not only receive uh, physically, but first we do receive virtually and based on IPSAS uh, or accordance to, INS to IPSAS, if we do receive virtually, we are already accountable, let's say, or responsible for that item. So all the different fields for the virtual goods received and in, in virtual inbound delivery are appearing over here as well, right? Plenty of them, actually. So that's for the summary tab. Okay, if we if I go to the details tab, you'll see that the whole report changes quite a bit. Okay, so this is a summary tab. And if I go to detail, I will see the information that I put in my initial prompt, right? So all the POs in the last five months for Vienna, regardless whether we have received been received or not. So all of them will be present in my report. And you'll see that. Defaulted, I have plenty here of rows. I have from the shopping cart to the contract, buyer, virtual PO, virtual PO number, PO status, virtual inbound delivery, virtual material no document, physical PO document, physical material document. So I have, let's say, the whole life cycle of this uh, material document from the starting of the process to the uh, to the end of the process, starting from the shopping cart. Contract buyer, PO status. If there is some sort of virtual inbound delivery in place, it will be present over here in my analysis. After the virtual received, we have a physical inbound delivery as well in place. So the whole, let's say, life cycle of this um, uh, inbound delivery from the shopping cart up until the goods received, it's present in my report. So you see plenty of rows here because all of these rows will be present in my report. So let me just get rid of uh, that layout. So we expand a little bit the analysis and even uh, collapse this data. So the report now, it's uh, easier to read shopping cart up until you see, I have to even scroll to my right to see all the different information here, okay? Obviously, if um, there is no shopping cart involved because it's uh, some sort of a um, uh, LVA, we don't have here a shopping cart number. So let me scroll down and see shopping cart numbers. It's a quite large report, so it takes a, just a little bit to refresh. So you see for this particular item, okay, I have a shopping cart. This is the number of the shopping cart. Uh, I have only one item here. This is the contract number. This is the buyer ID. ID basically is the Unite ID. Uh, there is no virtual PO, so there is no virtual PO item. The PO status is uh, this one. We'll have to define exactly which status that is if you don't know by heart. There is no virtual inbound. All right, so let me scroll to my right. See if it works. Okay, scroll to my right a little bit. Okay, um, a little bit more. So from the virtual material, yes, we have a physical PO number, which is the PO number with uh, the item. No physical inbound delivery yet. The year when the physical material document year is uh, done, 2020. This is the material document received after the goods receipt was done. This is the 50 document the goods received created eventually with two items. 101 is the MIGO created, the movement type, and it's been received. And then if I scroll to my right, I have here information on the number of POs. But so this is a way in the details tab to see, let's say, from A to Z what it's been happening to all these, let's see, receiving uh, situations of 
uh, an item from the shopping cart perspective up until the goods received perspective. So um, uh, this one, it's quite useful to have it, uh, let's say, in already saved in your uh, favorites. If you have this um, report and you have access to this report, it will be a matter of going to the prompt, selecting the items that you think are uh, that or you, you understand that uh, belong to your own entity, right? So if you're, for example, in Santiago de Chile, you will select your own plant, you will select your date range of these POs, whether you want this analysis for reception or not, whether you want contracts or not. And when you're comfortable with the prompt, you launch the report, and then you save the report. on your own favorites, right? My documents, and then you can create a subfolder and you can put a name to that uh, report. I can put, for example, monitoring uh, receipts. Uh, in this case, it's UNOP, for example, right? And I can put here 2020 from January. In this case, is January to May, for example. And you can save this report. So it's there. So every time I go to my documents, my documents here, mm, I think I didn't put in, I think it's in my favorites over here. You see, I created by, created on. I think I didn't save it in, in the folder I took. See if it is here. Mm -hmm. It's weird. I thought I'd see. In the meantime, as I look for the report, is there any question before I? Yes, yes, Danny. Um, Hasim is asking. Uh, they have um, actually in the regional office, they managing 57 projects grant um, and the PO created funded by certain grants. How to include the grant idea in one of the column mm -hmm. to be able to match it with the different POs? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see if I find it. So uh, I'm clicking on again on, on the on the this blue bluish cube. So I will see whether and let me go from the starting of the attributes whether I find order or a project that may identify some sort of account assignment. Storage location receive it should be around there. Delivery consumption in code term PO number PO type reporting entity irrigation of service creation shopping car status virtual. I will have to take a look because I don't know them by heart. Sometimes uh, uh, it changes the attributes from one to the other. I don't know if by PO type if we can select order in PO type and then we will see um, POs only related to, um, let's say, internal orders or projects. Uh, PO type is not there. So, uh, okay, I will I will get back to that uh, with that. Okay, don't worry. It's uh, I will send uh, an email related to that. But I'm sure there is a way to identify whether it's a project or not. I will have to to look it up in the in the left panel. Um, so that's a, as per the, the POs, the BI part for the POs, as I said before, in, in production, if I go to folders here, source to acquire, besides this one, we have another one, which is the PO purchase order analysis area, which currently is not working to yesterday and today, but tomorrow will be available or tomorrow, let's say next week, where you can do not only the analysis by goods received, but, but PO in general, right? And it's quite interesting because there you can filter by type of PO, type of uh, service material, and it's a pretty good report as well. Um, before I, uh, I, I would like to jump into, uh, into ECC just a little bit to show to you 
I don't know, some of the reports that I uh, sent to you through the presentation yesterday. Remember that uh, Brian and myself, we went through these rarity codes, ME22N, in order to see the PO by document number. Uh, ME2K by account assignment. Remember that we have to put some sort of call center fund or budget period in order to, to break down all the different uh, POs. Then we have we can do the same by material. So you select the material ID, and from there you'll have a list of POs linked to that material ID. Uh, by vendor, you can select a particular vendor and then do an analysis from there. Uh, by supplying funds, in case that uh, you do have uh, um, inventory, and uh, this is particularly important in case that. Uh, you're working with STOs because it can show you the list of STOs, the 48 or 45 type of document as well. Uh, and then information on whether this PO is a service and the percentage of these services. So I'm going to use this one, ME2S, that I like a lot because it's a quite uh, useful T code. Let me see whether I. Because Logging into the training environment takes two minutes, and I think it's useful for you to see how these T codes work. And especially because we haven't talked so much about services. And uh, so, oh, on this one. All right, so it's training environment. Remember that it's, it's the training environment, and it's not production. So, when I use 520. OK, so um, it's ME, let me get back, ME2S. So this is the T code. Then I will have to uh, identify uh, either a vendor or a purchasing group. But uh, I'm here going to use the plant US00. So it's New York. And then on a range of dates, um sort of a validity period start validity period for example first of january 2020 up until today so the idea is to uh, from this plant from eu 00 but you can use your own plant uh you will get all the po's related to services and the status of those services as well so let me execute and for this particular case, although it's you know looks very simple, but uh, here what I can find is one, two, three, four, five, and six POs starting with twenty-five. Remember what we said the other day: if it, if it starts with twenty-five, that means that it's uh, for a uh, consultant service or for ICNC, right? It's a it's a PO raised for ICNC. So it will be a matter to go one by one. You select on the first one. And you'll see information on whether the service has been rendered, whether the service has been partially rendered, whether it has not been rendered, the account assignment, which is the cost center. So how to read this? In case that uh, you know, kind of like looks uh, a bit difficult to read, you have always this icon here, which is the legend. If you click on the legend, you will have a description to each of these icons. Okay. So this, let's say, file type of icon will be the PO. So this is the PO, the PO number. Then the item, one item, which is in the individual contractor services per week. Um, outline line. Then whether the services have been accepted or not will be visible through a green dot or red dot. In this case, it will be green, right? So, but as you can see in this uh, percentage, let me. Close this one. If I expand a little bit, this percentage would means that 20% of the services initially, right, that its value is $7,500, have been rendered. So I may assume that, let's see, one out of five weeks have been already, let's say, paid in this case, right? So payment for one week, it's $1,500. And this is the account assignment that's going to be used with the coast center to pay this consultant. We have paid, we have paid him or her 
$1,500, but still pending $6,000, right? So, um, and this is the service and the, the service entry sheet. If you double click over there, you will display the service entry sheet accepted for this particular contractor. It's the payment for one week. Uh, it's 1,500, and this is the service, individual contractor services for a week. And this is the period, the period where the uh, services took place, first week, let's say, of February 2020. And uh, you have information on the validation, on the vendor evaluation, long text, all history related to who created the service entry sheet, who changed, and stuff like that. So you can even enter the service entry sheet number and the status of that service entry sheet directly from this report. In order to go back, we go to the green arrow here, and then we will be going to the PO. Yes, Aida? Um, no, no, nothing. I think somebody unmuted himself. I will check that. Sorry. Ah, OK, thanks. So um, that's for, uh, let me go back. That's for the first PO. Then if you want to check for, let's check the last one here. What we can see is that uh, no service has been rendered so far. So you see 0%. So we haven't paid this uh, individual constructor in a month. It's $2,000. If we click on the identification, then we go to the system or here. I don't think. Let's see if I can. If you double, if we double click on the PO, we will go directly to ME 23N. To see, this is the transaction ME 23N, and there we will have the PO created for this particular um, uh, contractor with account assignments and the different uh, items related to the data and services that uh, he or she will provide. Okay? So uh, I think it's uh, it's basically giving you a list of POs for services. In this case, for these are 25 type of POs uh, by plant here. So if I select here, for example, another plant, I don't know if in the training environment we have uh, more information. I'm going to use Inifil. No, and then let me see CD10, just in case I see another type of service. No, so we have all the information on US00 here. But uh, you can definitely check in production your own uh, POs related to services using this T code, ME2S, only four services. Displays the list of PO services and allows to see you the overview of the PO and their service entry sheets and values as well. I don't know if anyone wants to uh, uh, throw a question or uh, on the chat. There's no there's no question at the moment. I don't know if someone wants to intervene um, at this point, but no questions. No questions. Okay, good. So um, for the rest. It's uh, the T codes that you can see in the presentation are more or less uh, very similar. Everything pivots to the PO, but uh, um, the starting point may be, let me start from the beginning, the document number. So you will use ME2N. Starting point may be the account assignment, your co center, the fund, the budget period. It may be your starting point to do analysis by the POs by the material type by the vendor, by the supply implant, or eventually, if it is a service, by the service itself. And then in the presentation, you have here the prompt related to the PO receipts and the report itself with the different, uh, let's see, layouts that you may see in the that we went through in the BR report, only for receipts monitoring. And sorry, it didn't work the other one, the analysis works based for PO. But uh, once you have the once you have the access with PA23, uh, I'm sure you will be able to 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 analyze the data for your own for your own entity. And in case that you encounter any issues or you need further support, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call or we or can reach out to us as well. Um, I think someone is unmuted, or I don't know. In case that you want to speak up, yeah, but, um, one. Uh, 
I don't know who's unmuted, but one question from Claude who's asking if the access is limited to the plant we belong to. Yeah, no, 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 the good thing uh, of the, well, I think one of the only good things about the access in BI, sometimes it's a bit cumbersome, as you can imagine, with all these roles and access. But the good thing is once you have full access, like via 233, you will be able to see all plants, all entities and all information within the system. Uh, so no restrictions in that area. Okay, thank you. That, there is no other questions there, so uh, that's it. Okay, so it's 401. Uh, we could stay more time, but uh, I think that at least from the PO perspective, you have a full scope of the T codes that you can use in order to analyze POs. Remember the, the T codes that we went through uh, in this presentation, as long as two BA reports that uh, the first one uh, for the PO receipts will give you a visual of the goods received, virtual goods receipts, the plans, the um, material type, all the POs related to any particular buyer, and the goods received and material documents created, the one that we saw before. And then the other one, the PO analysis workspace will give you a full access to everything related to POs. And uh, it's the biggest queue of data in the whole source to acquire uh, folder. So once you have access, I'm sure you will enjoy it. So uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Brian or Saida or Sol in case that you want to intervene, because I think it's uh, more than enough no? for five days and a lot of uh, information sessions. Uh, so uh, probably we want to wrap up and uh, see what uh, the next steps are. Over to you guys. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, it's more than enough. A good, good BI session as well. I'm sure that it, it is it's Friday. It's a, it's been a long week. If you guys have any questions, let's keep the floor open for some Q and A. If not, I think right now would probably be the best moment to share the survey of this particular session, uh, Daniel. And then what we can also do is uh, inform you guys. I'm unsure. I have seen that Sol has sent the emails already with the exercises and I believe maybe the credentials that so you guys may have received that in your inbox already. Now, I'm not sure if the survey was also sent and shared through email. Okay, so John is confirming both emails. That's good. That means that it has been sent and we would be just having to share the uh, the final survey and the survey of this particular session. I think you, uh, Daniel is already sharing the survey, there is a question here from Sonia, though, uh, first thing. What is the validity for our credentials in the training environment? What is the validity for our credentials? OK, validity, I guess you mean your own EIDMS credentials are the ones you'll use to log in. But then to log into the training environment, you're going to need the credentials provided in your cover page. No, I think she meant the credentials that you just shared for the exercise in the cover page, how long those are available or valid okay, there you be go. used. Thanks. I think, Sonia, yeah. please intervene if I'm interrupting. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. They're, they're basically, they should be fine for the next three months. They could even be fine for the next year if you're going to take a year to do them, or they could expire <laughs> next week. Sometimes the... Uh, the training yeah. environment in, in Umoja, right? They they start tampering with the environment and then suddenly what worked today doesn't work tomorrow. Uh, but it's not the case. It's not usually. Yeah, and before, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Brian. Before they were changing the password in the training environment every month. Uh, but uh, I hope it, because in the latest months they didn't do that. So I hope it will work, at, as Brian said. Uh, two, three months. If you find any issue that you cannot log in, just let us know because maybe something was changed. And I forgot to mention it before to you guys, I think this weekend, just in case for those of you who are willing to start uh, practicing in the system, I think this weekend they are going to perform some changes in the Moja tool. So oh, yes, probably, thanks. So, yeah. thanks for that. For, yes. Mm -hmm. So probably it will not work. Maybe you will try to, if you find a, or encounter issues during this weekend, maybe it's because they are working on it. Okay. And once I'm here, just I wanted to say thank you to everybody. It's uh, been our pleasure to be to be with you guys during the, these five days. And that we remain here for whatever you will need. Okay. Thanks a lot. And over to you, Brian. 
Okay, thank you. And yes, uh, more questions in the chat that I see. Okay, we've been mentioning this, but of course, let, let's say this again and, and let's make sure everyone understands this. The exercises are for you to practice only. Okay, if you want to do them, fine. If you don't, it's fine just as well. Okay, we're giving them to you so you can go through the transactions that you guys have seen us perform. Uh, we can provide support. Again, we do have to remind you that we can't provide you support immediately or on a daily basis, seven days a week, because we're involved in other trainings. We just decided that uh, personally we would create these credentials and exercises for you to be able to practice. Okay, the certification is only based on the assessment, nothing more. Okay, there's no time to submit the exercises. You don't need to submit them to anyone. You just have to do them if you want to. Okay, they're, they're yours just to practice. Okay, and thanks, Haida, for stating that in the chat as well. This is just a completely uh, extra thing that we provide to you. Um, besides that, nothing more, I don't think, um, if I'm forgetting something. The exam is May 27th. Nonetheless, don't worry. The exam uh, will be sent to you through an email with a link. The link will remain open all day. You'll have all day to submit it and take your time and review and, and study for the submission uh, of the exam. But remember, we're only going to take your first submission. So if uh, by any chance you feel that you didn't do that well the first time and the second time around it was better, we're going to go with the first one. Nonetheless, if by any chance you don't pass, we can always work on a retake uh, exam. I think you guys will do fine, but we can always work on a retake assessment uh, and we'll uh, reach out to you guys to inform you on that. But right now, it's May 27th is the date of the exam. You have the recordings all in the Teams channel. I'm uploading them also in the YouTube channel. It's taking quite a while, but I'll have them there. Um, actually, this weekend, you'll be able to review them. And we'll also uh, share an email with that link. Now, with the survey, I know Daniel has shared the survey for the session. It's actually in the chat, yes. And uh, Sol, did you send an email with the final survey, or is that still to be sent? No, no, it is. It hasn't been sent yet, so okay. maybe we can share it here and exactly. later on send an email for those that couldn't take it. Or... Exactly. I think we can share it here in the chat. We can share it in the channel of Teams and even in an email. And uh, wherever you can access it and give us your feedback, please do. Uh, just submit it once, of course, and please do if you if you can kindly submit it. It's very useful that you do submit the surveys daily for us, but also very important that you submit this final survey because this is quite more official and this is the one we usually share with management. If uh, you guys can take some time to do that. Uh, again, the test is the 27th, 2-7, okay, Wednesday, May 27th. We'll reach out with an email and Saida has just posted the link to the assessment. I to the assessment, to the survey, sorry, I'm talking about assessment and I said assessment. <laughs> yeah, that's, okay. um, that's the, the link for the survey, the, covering the entire training, right? So, and um, and I posted as well that the date is the 27th, uh, Faiza, um, the, the assessment is the 27th. Okay, thanks, uh, Saida, Sol, Daniel, and all of the attendees. I'm going to stop the recording now. I don't think there's going to be any.